Amen. Thank you, Kristen. Melissa, appreciate that much. John chapter 20, if you join me there, John chapter 20, this morning's message. Again, so much appreciate you being out today and thankful for your taking the time to worship the Lord with us and with me. And I trust it will be both profitable, encouraging, our time spent around God's Word this morning. John chapter 20, I'll point you in the verse direction in just a moment. The title of this morning's message is simply this, Missing in Action. MIA, as it's commonly referred to in the acronym, Missing in Action, MIA. If you find your spot there, look up this way, if you would. 1942, the United States' participation in World War II was in its infancy. By November of that year, of 1942, not even a full year after the devastating attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. was engaged in battle on several fronts across the world, already becoming immersed in World War II. One of those fronts was called the Guadalcanal Campaign. It was named for the island in which uh, that the battles had surrounded, the naval battles surrounding that area and so forth, that island and so forth. One of the ships that was involved there in that campaign in the very fierce fighting, especially in the fall of 1942, was the USS Juno. The USS Juno was classified as a light cruiser, somewhat of a, a certainly a lighter, sure, smaller ship than a battleship and such, obviously. Yet on that ship, there was a unique group of men. Uh, there were five brothers. They were known as the Sullivan Brothers interesting background they had enlisted just that year January 3rd in fact after the new year began in 1942 and as they had enlisted they had one stipulation we all want to serve together five brothers so they did you might ask why did they want to join well certainly they wanted to defend America they want to defend their nation but there's also a very personal reason they wanted to join these five brothers had one sister. Kind of reminds me of my own family with six boys and one girl. But they had one sister. And her sister had had a fiancé who was aboard the USS Arizona as it was stationed in Pearl Harbor just the year before. He had died and been killed in that attack there in Pearl Harbor. And so they had part of their impetus, their motivation for joining up was to avenge his death. The fiancé of their sister. Well, as they were then uh, deployed onto the USS Juno, they were there in the Guadalcanal campaign fighting. And on a fateful day in November of 1942, the USS Juno was hit by an enemy torpedo, a Japanese torpedo. It was damaged heavily, yet it could uh, maneuver a little bit. It could uh, find uh, or go through the water. And, and so uh, it began a very slow process of attempting to return to the closest U.S. base for repairs, to tend to the wounded and such. On their way there, a Japanese submarine found them. It was hit by a, a torpedo of a Japanese submarine that is believed that it was close to where the ammunitions were stored and immediately the ship exploded and rapidly sank. Uh, many were killed in the initial explosion, uh, but there were a few survivors that were in the water. Sadly, most of those survivors that had uh, at least were still alive after the sinking of the ship, most of them died in the water because somehow there was a paper issue and so forth. A rescue mission was not started for several days. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think there was only about 10 to 15 men pulled from the waters. Well, as you can imagine, the home people at home and family members were uh, wondering what had happened and, and uh, why was that? Well, uh, the Navy did not reveal the loss, obviously, because they were trying to protect the movements, the offenses, and the, uh, the actions of their different uh, boats and such. And so they never revealed that the USS Juno had been sunk. Well, back home in Waterloo, Iowa, Mrs. Sullivan and her husband began to notice the letters dry up. By January of 1943, as you could imagine a mother would be, she was concerned. She had not heard from not just one of her sons, but all five. Not one single letter since November. So she contacted the Bureau of Naval Personnel. And after she did so in early January, 
On January 13, 1943, a letter arrived from the president at the time, President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And in that letter, he explained to her that, and her husband, the Mr. and Mrs. Sullivan, that her sons were considered missing in action. That terminology, it's a terrible term as you think about it. It evokes great fears. It uh, uh, brings the saddest con uh, perception of reality, of what lies ahead, a future lost, if we may describe it as such. Never seen a loved one again, the possibility of it. Missed treasure events and activities, the highlights of someone's life are, will be missed, the blessings no longer enjoyed. Missing in action. When one is missing in action, there is much missed. Sadly, that letter, when it reached the parents on January 13th, we might say it was a day late. On January 12th. Mr. Sullivan, I believe, um, uh, was getting ready for his job early on that day. And all of a sudden, as he was preparing to go to work, there was a knock at his door. As they opened the door, before them stood a lieutenant commander, a naval doctor, and a chief petty officer. The commander, or the naval officer, excuse me, spoke up and just simply said to Mr. Sullivan, his wife, I have some news for you about your boys. Mr. Solomon, Sullivan, excuse me, whose name was Tom, simply said, which one? The officer replied, I'm sorry, all five. All five of the Sullivan brothers had perished in the sinking of the USS Juno. Three, they believe, had died on impact on the initial destruction of the boat the sinking two of them had gotten into the water alive but then succumbed to their injuries that they had received under the attack the days that followed <laughs> the years that followed really they became known as the five fighting sullivan brothers they became national heroes you see them on the poster here and uh, the terminology was they've done their part will you even Mr. and Mrs. Sullivan traveled around and encouraged, giving encouraging speeches and challenging others to give. Yet the reality is this, life went on. Much was missed as they were obviously missing in action. The youngest Sullivan brother, his name was Al, he was married, he had a son. There would be missed birthdays, missed anniversaries, missed Christmases, missed first games, recitals. And many other firsts that would be missed, first steps, first w words spoken, first day of school, and so on. Several of the other brothers had fiancés that they had had plans to marry and establish a family together. And you can imagine what all was missed and all the special days and events that would no longer be enjoyed, experienced. You see, when you're missing in action, much is missed. In our text for us this morning, we have a person, someone, in fact, he's pretty important. He is a, a familiar person that is missing in action. Look at verse 24, if you will, with me, of John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse number 24. It says this, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Thomas, good old Thomas. We know him as Doubting Thomas, and yet by the end of, man, it messed up my thing, Thomas. Okay, uh, messed that up, didn't it? And uh, going from my computer to the computer back there, nonetheless. Thomas, we know him as what? Doubting Thomas. I think by the end of this message, we'll have a different description of Thomas um, that I think applies even greater to the fact that he doubted. He had been with the disciples. He was one of the twelve. He is part of the pack. The, he was part of the, the entourage of Jesus Christ. He was very important. He had been through all the experiences, the three, three and a half years of Christ's ministry. He had traveled with them. He had gone out with the other disciples to cities that Christ was going to visit. Uh, he was a huge part of that. He was with them during the ups and the downs of Christ's ministry. He, he was one of them. And yet here his band of brothers are gathered together, as verse 19 says, and he wasn't there. He was not there. 
And I just put it this way, and I think this is so crucial. Thomas was missing in action uh, at a crucial time for his own faith. He was missing in action at a crucial time for his own faith. And it will bear out in this morning's message. His comrades, his friends, uh, his fellow workers, his fellow disciples, followers of Christ, the, the inner core, um, uh, that group that was with Jesus for so long were assembled. And they were in desperate need of comfort. They were in desperate need of encouragement. They were in desperate need of, of some boost in the arm spiritually. Why was that? Verse number 9 tells us, or 19, excuse me, verse number 19 tells us. Look at it, if you will. Verse number 19 of this passage. Same day at the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst, and he said unto them, Peace be unto you. Why were they gathered? There's a one-word answer. Why were they gathered? It was what? Fear. Fear of the Jews. Why? Because the world had been turned upside down. The man they had followed, the Savior, was gone. Their world had been turned upside down, and fear was prevalent. Fear flooded their hearts. Fear was now the number one public enemy among the disciples. Now, can we not emphasize or empathize with them today? Fear. Fear. Do we not live in a world in which there is much fear? Even as followers of Jesus Christ, is there not even more added fear for the future and fear of things to come? How many of us even today fear that uh, the economy will continue to tank? And speaking of tanks, it's hard to fill one up anymore, amen? It's going to only get worse. Reading just the other day, the inflation within a grocery store is 13.1 at this moment. The increase, cost, and so forth. You say you go in to buy a package of bacon, you tell the grocer, I don't want to buy the whole pig, just the bacon. It's true, it feels that way. And it only seems like it's going to be worse. The, the prognosis, the forecast uh, economically is, is not good. Well, it's, the gas is skyrocketing, and so we're going to uh, stop production. That makes sense. I mean, just worse, the economy, it sounds terrible. There's much that could be fear, that is reality. I don't know about you, but uh, in the last few weeks, there's been greater talk of nuclear war in Europe. That could certainly spread and involve us and touch us. Can we not say there's a legitimate fear of World War III breaking out? There's nothing in the Scriptures that says that can't happen before the rapture and the tribulation. It's possible. There's legitimate fear of worldwide war we can fear domestic terrorism it is certainly true that every week it seems we read of somebody killing somebody else here in america we read of serial killings we read of things happening and and in, in, instead of loving your neighbor boy we we want to shoot our neighbor kill our neighbor we can fear as christians the increasingly hostile world in which we live towards what we believe towards what the bible teaches what we stand for the cancel culture gaslighting all these terminologies that basically uh, people can just kind of dismiss you and honestly attack you for the beliefs you hold we can also fear rejection and hostility from what from those who hate God in the Bible. Man, there's much to be feared in the world. I, if we're honest, uh, th there's a reality. To, th there is much going on. And, and the, we were talking even in our Sunday school class today. The reality is this. Boy, change is happening as quickly as it has ever happened in history. So it's changing all the time. And sometimes change itself could be fear. So in the face now don't miss it. Believer, would you not miss this? In the face of such great fear, what does verse 19 tell us the disciples do, did? What do they do? Look at it again, verse 19. When the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled. Why? For fear of the Jews. What did they do? They assembled they got together. They said, hey, boy, this is a terrible time. This is a horrible time. We need comfort. We need encouragement. We need to build one another up. They were assembled. 
They gather together. It's why you and I believe, I trust you and I believe together so strongly in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling ourselves together as the manner of some is. And we could write in there, Thomas. That's Thomas. The disciples had gathered together. It was as crucial a time as ever. Much fear was faced. His faith needed to gather together with those of like faith. And yet, as the manner of some is, Thomas. Not forsaking the assembling ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And then verse 24 comes right along with it, and it adds a greater impetus, or as great an impetus, for us gathering together in the face of fearful times. The world in which we live, how crucial it is for the assembling together. Verse 24, you know it well, it says, and let us consider one another. So it's not a selfish reason. It's not just you and I thinking of only of ourselves. No, let us consider one another to provoke into love and good works. You see, there in that room where the disciples were gathered with the doors shut, and I just can imagine they're locked and the, the lights are kept low. Maybe they hear, heard a chariot go by on the outside road, and they're like, shh, shh, is that the Jews? Is that the Jews? Maybe they're coming for us. Maybe, maybe the innkeeper or maybe the, the person who let us use this room or maybe a neighbor, they saw us gathering together and they reported it to the high priest and they're going to try to snuff out any semblance of the followers of Jesus Christ. So you can imagine the fear in that room and the anxiety of, oh my goodness, are they going to come and get us anytime? Let's make sure someone's at the door just listening. And as they gather there in that room, yet in spite of all the fear, they were doing what you and I are doing here today, gathering together as believers in a fearful time. They were experiencing what we would say from that passage of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 25 and 26, the threefold benefit of the assembly. Now, let, let's step back a second. I hope you came today. I hope you assemble when the church gathers together to worship God because that is preeminent. That is number one. We have gathered to worship God. And yet... God says there's also great benefit and great reason to gather together beyond the worship of God Almighty. Can we worship God anywhere? Certainly. Yet God himself has designated the assembly, the gathering together of believers, as the means of worship corporately. But there's a threefold benefit of assembly. There's a threefold duty, responsibility too. What is it? Well, from the, th the passage, we get three things. Number one, we are to encourage godly living. The Bible says there in Hebrews 10, provoke unto good works. One of the challenges you and I have today is we gather together. It's like, wow, you're still faithful to God. You're still living to God. That encourages me to still be faithful to God. You live for God today, you witnessed today, you handed out a track, you told somebody about Jesus Christ, that's encouraging to me, that provokes me into good works in the week ahead. You kept on keeping on this week, and so it's an encouragement to me to keep on keeping on next week. God's word is obviously the eternal source of comfort and encouragement, and we come to hear it preached, we come to consider it, we come to hear it taught in Sunday school, we come to hear it sung about, we come to memorize it on Sunday nights together. Why? Because the reality is this, we need to be encouraged and provoked into good works. That's why we're here today. That's the purpose of this meeting, this service, this gathering together, to be encouraged there's certainly a second benefit in the, the passage. Good. Exhort one another in the teaching and the promises of our Savior. Exhorting one another. So much the more as you see the day approaching. A grand responsibility and benefit of gathering together. To be encouraged. To be built up. To be exhorted by one another. In what? The only way to live, which is according to God's word. Exhorted in that. Hey, man, I, you're going through this tough time. Remember what God's word says. Remember the promise of his scriptures. Remember, and that happens in conversations before the service and after the service. That happens when you and I shake hands and we greet one another or we bump elbows because we don't get sick or whatever it is. Knuckles. We, we just encourage one another. We exhort one another. Hey, keep on, keep it on. I know you're going through a hard time. Cast all your cares upon him for he careth for you. Don't forget to be a... Don't forget to be a light. You're the light of the world. We're exhorted. We're challenged. Keep loving your family. Keep loving your wife. Be faithful. Don't be weary in well-doing. 
We could go down the long list of instructions and promises that God has given us. It's in exhorting one another. And I love this last aspect. You know what it says? Provoke unto love. Literally, it's the picture of, and I hit it one more time. It's the picture of you and I embracing one another through connection. Embracing one another through connection. Provoke unto love. Love for each other. Love for God. We're supposed to connect on that level. Let's say this morning you were coming to church and somehow you, you, you took a wrong turn, even though you've been here forever. But you took a wrong turn. And let's say that, uh, or you took a wrong turn, let's say you're coming from the north in Mayville and, and uh, <coughs> you accidentally went straight instead of turning left in the parking lot and all of a sudden you found yourself in front of the tribesmen down here in Fostoria. And without realizing it, you walk in there. Okay, if you don't know what the tribesmen are, don't worry about it, it's not important. <laughs> You walk in there, and you look around, and let's say they're having a meeting today. I don't think they are. I didn't get any notification of it. Um, <laughs> this is a joke. Okay. Um, uh, you walk in there, they're meeting today, and, and you're like, wow, I don't really have too much in common with these people. <laughs> I don't, I'm not wearing my black leather. <laughs> uh, didn't drive my bike here. You look around, like, eh, we don't have much in common here. Yeah, you don't. Isn't it good, though, to walk into a church and know you have in common a love for God? That's what this is. We connect. We're connecting on a level that we can't have anywhere else. And don't believe for a second the devil or the world that says, oh, we can have camaraderie. We can have community. We can have this on all the other places. There is no community like the community of Jesus Christ. Where you and I connect on a level that supersedes, that trumps all other levels. Yes, we can have meetings on different things with people in the world, but there is nothing like the gathering together of God's people who love him and love one another. And hence the reason you and I are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I don't know about you, but I need to hear about somebody after living in a world that hates God. I need to rub shoulders with people who love God. I need encouragement when it comes from walking with you through these hours we spend together, through these times where we talk about what's important in life according to God's word, the priorities of scripture. We talk about heaven. We talk about the future. We talk about our savior. We talk about what he's done for us. And my friend, we need that connection. That's what the gathering's all about. And can I tell you, as those disciples in the face of great fear, they needed one another. They needed that kind of assembly. They needed to be together in the face of great fear. Today, you and I need the assembly of God's people. Can I just tell you, it was a sad day when disciples looked around and, is everyone here? Is everyone here? Hey, hey, John, ha have you seen Andrew? Oh, yeah, he's over in the corner over there. Yeah, okay, good, okay, good, good. And, and what about Nathaniel? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's working over there. Okay, good, good, good. And so is everybody here? And somebody says, I, you see Thomas? What? Tom Thomas, Thomas, you here? And quiet. Because Thomas wasn't there. Oh, he needed it. <laughs> His soul desperately needed to be there. But he was not. It was a sad day when Thomas didn't show up like everyone else. And may I tell you, it's a sad day for any congregation when its own membership and faithful attendees begin to be absent from the gatherings, the services. It's a sad day for any congregation when those who compose uh, uh, the membership can be counted on to be there for social func functions, to be there in place, their place of business or job, but cannot be counted on when the interests of the kingdom are at stake. When the Son of God sounds the bell for feeding time at the table with the family. The gathering of the church. My friend, we need this environment. We need the connection, the encouragement, the exhortation that comes and occurs in this place. When we shine the light of focus. And what do we get to do in this place? We get to shine the light of focus on the amazing love of our God. John said it well. God is love. My friend, in an unlovely world, in a place that rejects us and t tells us our beliefs are archaic, mean, and the description goes on, we need a place where you and I can come and we know that God is love. We can bask in the love of our God this morning. 
You and I can be rejuvenated. We can be encouraged, refreshed in that truth. We know the passage as well. John would go on to write the very next verse after he wrote that God is love. He says this, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Aren't you glad you're alive today, Christian? Let's try that again because some of you don't act like you're alive. Maybe you need to wake up. Hey, Christian, you're glad you're alive today. In Jesus Christ, we are alive. This was the love of God manifested to us that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary so that you and I might live. And it isn't just talking about a heaven for eternity. My friend, when you trusted Jesus Christ, the moment you did, you began to live. The new life found only in Christ. Herein is love, verse number 10 continues. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation, the payment for our sins. I love what Christ said. He's looking at his disciples. He says, listen, I want to give you a new law. Uh, that mosaic law, that's good. There's great principles there, but I want to give you a new law, law. Now listen to what the law is. He says, disciples, pay attention. I want you to love each other as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. I believe in that room when they gathered. After the most horrific, devastating, heartbreaking, sorrowful day that they had experienced, their Savior hanging on a cross, being killed, murdered, and thrown in a grave. I believe they met in that room, and I think healing began to take place even before Jesus Christ showed up on the scene. But here's what I like. When God's people start gathering, guess who shows up? Jesus Christ. Where two or three are gathered in my aim, there am I in the midst he shows up but even before he does the reality is i think they were encouraging each other they were exhorting each other they were building one another up they're embracing one another they're connecting with one another i can just picture it now i think peter was probably kind of just sulking in a corner i can see john going over and hey peter it's gonna be okay it's gonna be all right remember what christ said remember this remember what mary just said about seeing him hey come on it'll be fine peter we'll be all right I can imagine Mary Magdalene going to the other disciples, hey, remember what I told you. This is what he said. Here's what he said. Even after I see him, I tell you, it was him. He said it was him. Uh, those on the road to Emmaus that had come back and said, listen, we, he spoke with us. He broke bread with us. And as he prayed, we realized who he was. I believe there's encouragement. I believe there's exhortation taking place in that room. Uh, I would put it more so this way. Love flowed in that room. Let's remember God loves us. He will not forsake us nor leave us. The Jews are at the door in their minds. They're fearing what could take place. Christ died. He was crucified. Are we next? There was great fear. And yet they reminded themselves of the love of God and they loved one another. A perfect love. Hey, young person, can I encourage you? Hey, believer, can I encourage you? Hollywood knows nothing about perfect love. This world knows nothing about perfect love outside of knowing Jesus Christ. And yet, what are we told in scriptures? What is the power of perfect love? The power of perfect love is simply what John said in verse 18 of chapter 4. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. I, I love, <laughs> no pun intended, but I love what the passage says. Here they are, they're feared. Verse 19, they're scared to death. Jews are hunting them down in their minds. They're thinking, we're next. This is terrible. The world's falling apart. As you and I have much to fear. That's the reality. As you and I come in today, we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know if America will fall apart by tomorrow. It could happen. We don't know if nuclear war will uh, explode in Ukraine and Russia and then spread across Europe. We don't know if China will use that as their opportunity to go crazy. We don't know what's going to happen in Michigan come this next election and if we say Sentence babies to death. We don't know what's going to happen with Christian beliefs. We don't know where we're at next month, next week, next year. You and I might, just for saying that marriage is between a man and a woman, we might be thrown in jail. I might be risking it here, saying that from a pulpit. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But I'll tell you, I sure am thankful for the love of God. Because it casts out fear. 
And as that group of disciples, may I just describe them as such, like their tail between their legs, they gathered in that room. The reality is this, fear could have won the day, but it didn't. They gathered together and they got to experience that truth, that perfect love does indeed cast out all fear. But sadly, there's one missing in action. There's one missing. His name is Thomas. So begs the question, why was he missing? And my friend, as we consider this thing and bring this part of the sermon to a close, the reality is this, we ought to ask ourselves, am I missing at times in action because of the same things? Am I missing in action the same way Thomas was? Maybe for the same reason, maybe not. For another reason, am I missing? Maybe, maybe you're not. You're here on a Sunday morning, praise the Lord for that. Maybe you're faithful, you're never missing in action, but you know someone who is. You've talked to somebody, a, a fellow believer, and boy, they're just, ah, they're, they're just missing in action. They're like Thomas or whatever the case may be. Can I encourage you this morning, I think God's word has much to share with you and I. Why that may be, and why the need is great for them to gather together. To assemble together. Why was Thomas missing in action? Well, many today are missing in action for the assembling together because they are indifferent. Indifference has filled their heart. Can I just encourage you or remind you or point out that there are way too many believers who have separated themselves from the service of the church, the fellowship of the saints, because of inward indifference to spiritual things in the kingdom of the Lord. They have become indifferent to the teaching of God's word. They, they are Christians, and yeah, they know Christ, but the reality is eh, they have become indifferent to it. It is not as powerful in their life as it should be. It, it is not the, the literal bread of life it needs to be. Uh, they do not regularly find thy word and eat it, as the prophet said. They're indifferent to it. They easily then in turn become absorbed into a million other pursuits and interests in their lives. Their lives are filled with pursuits of this world. Their lives are, uh, are so overwhelmed with things that they become indifferent. In fact, there's, they are greatly uninterested in the things of the church and the affairs of the Savior's kingdom. And because of all that going on in their life, they're barely connected. They're barely in touch with the assembly they are literally missing in action, MIA. But I tell you this morning, as bad as that is, and as concerning as it ought to be, and as much as we don't want that to happen with people, that was not the case with Thomas. He had not become indifferent. He had not fallen into uh, being uh, kind of lured away by the world. That, that wasn't him. He hadn't lost his fervor. He hadn't, he, hadn't, he hadn't, in a sense, given up on God and Christ and just become indifferent to it. Or eh, It's not that important. He hadn't lost his priority in his life. Well, what about this? Many people today are missing in action because, for the assembling together because they have found satisfaction elsewhere. They have drunk of the waters of the world and uh, at those fountains of earthly pleasures, pursuits, they, entertainment. They have found an empty and fleeting satisfaction, but it's a satisfaction they think will last. It'll fill their la lifetime. It'll give them great fulfillment. They have found meaning, and how sad it is to say this truth. They have found meaning for their lives, fulfillment for their lives, and something other than living for Christ and following him fully. Can we not be reminded this morning that you and I were created for the pleasure of God? You and I are created to walk with God. You and I are created a new creature in Christ. That he has before ordained us that we might walk in what? Good works. To bring him glory. Yet some have found meaning, fulfillment of life. Oh, it is very possible that disappointment, that sorrow, discouragement, heartache, bitterness, uh, a wrong has opened the door to seeking that elsewhere. Yet that believer chooses to walk through it. They try to find fulfillment and satisfaction for one's life somewhere that God never intended for it to be found for his prized creation. They find it in a world that is quickly falling apart. A world that is quickly going to be destroyed. And where they have found fulfillment will have no lasting eternal impact. Hear me, church. The simple reality is this, far too many Christians have turned aside to find something in this world that meets their needs, quote unquote, more and better than what they think God could do in this assembly for them. 
only to find out when it is too late that the needs that were met elsewhere were not their greatest needs. My friend, that is a true statement. True statement. One we ought to take to heart. Far too many Christians have turned aside, find something in this world that quote-unquote meets their needs. More and better than what they think God could do in this assembly and in his church, only to find out when it is way too late that the needs that they thought were the greatest were not their greatest need. See, disappointment and sorrow and unsatisfaction leave them lean and empty. But finding satisfaction elsewhere, now, that wasn't Thomas's problem. He didn't run back to the temple like, wow, Christ is a fake. He's, a, uh, he's died. Uh, what is that? I, I need to find a different religion. I, I need to find fulfillment somewhere else. I need to find satisfaction. That really wasn't Thomas's problem. That's, that's not why he was absent. That's not why he was missing in action there in that room. In John chapter 20 and verse 24. You see, many today miss the assembling together. They're missing in action because they've lost hope. They've lost hope. And it is here among this group that we find Thomas. You see, he couldn't get it out of his head that Christ was dead and that with him the cause was forever lost. He believed that now right was forever defeated by wrong, that evil was forever enthroned. If we could do it in a picturesque way, the reality is this, there was nothing but clouds and a darkened sky over his head. Empty of even one single ray of hope. For far too many people, even believers, the events and circumstances of their own lives have erased any hope. They have left them too with clouds and a darkened sky perpetually over their heads. May I ask you this, have you ever thought about it? Have you ever considered where in the world, or better put, where in Jerusalem was Thomas? Where was he? Certainly the twelve were gathered. We can maybe uh, suppose that there were other followers there. Whatever the case may be, whether that's true or not, where was Thomas? Was he at home sulking in his bed? Was he walking the streets of the city and maybe kicking a stone along and lost in the thoughts of his heartache, the fact that his heart was broken? Was he sitting somewhere depressed and downhearted? Wherever he was, was not his greatest danger, but what was missing from his heart was his greatest danger. There was no hope. In his mind, he had no reason to cling to hope. Here's what I find interesting. Don't miss it this morning. In that meeting that Christ had the disciples, that Thomas wasn't there, as we'll study in next week, Christ says effectively, you know what he says to him? Don't miss this. It's not necessarily recorded here in John. It's recorded in one of the other Gospels. Here's what he says. He says this to the disciples. Why are you troubled? Why did thoughts arise in your hearts? Do you realize, do not miss it this morning. Do you realize what he said to those other disciples? Oh, you're so much better than Thomas because you aren't fearing. That's not what he says. He says, why are you troubled? Why is fear flooding your heart why are there thoughts in your mind that have crept up like what are we going to do what are the jews going to hurt us what what should what should we run should we escape is christ there? No, no, no he is saying what why is your heart troubled why are thoughts of hopelessness and fears and doubts and are in your hearts and your heads now listen to me though though those were there there was only one person missing in action because of his lack of hope. They shared the same fear and discouragement. They faced the same things. But they were clinging to hope. Church, would you listen to me this morning? I believe the scriptures bear this as truth. And I, I believe we can be confirmed in our experiences. It's simply this. The only difference. Ooh, yeah, there we go. Okay. The only difference. Okay, we'll find it eventually. The only difference between the believer that is an active disciple of Christ, and the believer that is an MIA despairer, and yes, I made up that word, that's why it's in quotes, a missing in action despairer in circumstances, listen to me, is that one still clings to hope. No matter how small that sliver of hope is. It's the only difference. 
The only difference between someone spiritually missing in action, uh, not gathering together, not, not being here to be encouraged in their own faith and exhorted, and, and those who are here, the only difference is, you know what? I'm still clinging to a little hope. Or lots of hope found in his word. So you see, they still assembled. They still obeyed. They still showed up. And can I tell you afterwards, weren't they glad they showed up? Why? Because Jesus Christ showed up. And his first words to them was, peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. They keep on keeping on. They refuse to loosen their grip on the great promises of their Savior. But it was not so with Thomas. See, what we know, Luke tells us, Mary Magdalene and the other, the other women that were there at the, the, the tomb that saw Christ, they made sure to tell each of the disciples what Christ has said, including Thomas. We know that. The Bible says they went and told him, hey, listen, we saw Christ, and here's what he said. And that ought to have been the sliver of hope they could have grabbed onto. And certainly most of them did. You see, they told him of the words that Christ spoke to them outside that empty tomb. They would have excitedly, those ladies, those women, told Thomas the message that Christ had given. He said, you remember, he specifically told them, hey, tell the disciples this. You remember it? It's recorded for us in Matthew 28, 10. Then said Jesus unto them, the ladies that had met him at the tomb, Mary Magdalene and others, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. Can I tell you? I'm grateful for the slivers of hope God gives us. I'm thankful that even today, you know, I say, man, the economy looks terrible. But aren't you grateful that God has given us the, that, that hope? I'll take care of you. I'll, I'll take care of you. I, I've never seen the righteous, uh, the children of the righteous begging bread. I'll take care of you. We see World War III maybe on the horizon. We don't know what it holds. But can I tell you right now, I know who holds the future. We know it. So there's a sliver of hope, if not larger than a sliver. There is hope for us to cling to. And that's what Thomas had. That's what the disciples had in this moment. It was powerful, hope-giving truth and news. But sadly, sadly, Thomas's reaction reveals, it teaches us a truth. What is that? Don't miss it. A heart empty of hope. A heart empty of hope often causes one to dismiss powerful, hope-giving truth. When you've lost hope, promises don't mean what they used to mean. When you've lost hope, it's hard for the truth to get through. When you've lost hope, we easily dismiss. I know that's true, but. You ever, say, you ever hear that from somebody? Ah, man, they're going through a difficult time, like, and you're just trying to encourage them. You're trying to exhort them. Remember, God's word says this. I know that, but. You know that tells me? They've lost hope. And because they've lost hope, there's not an open soil for the promises of God's word to take root. Because I don't know about you. I've seen some dark days. But I sure am thankful there's always been a root of light based upon the promises of God's word. But yet when there's no hope, when you don't hope in your God, when you don't hope in your Savior, those promises, those powerful, <laughs> hope-giving promises can't take root. See, I, I, I'm, I'm not, th this is not hypothetical in Thomas. Listen to me carefully. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 11, you know what it says? The, the ladies, the women went to him and told him, hey, this is what Christ said. He's going to see you. Go to Galilee. There's going to be a grand reunion there. You know what they records? And their words, that's the women, seem to them as idle tales. You're telling me a story. And they believed them not. But Jesus said it. He told me to give you the message. And I'll tell you, this is written of the disciples as a whole. I get that. But can I tell you who was, should be written of the most? Thomas. He's given up hope. I can just imagine Thomas responding to Mary. Mary comes to him, Thomas, hey, this is what Christ said. The guys are getting together. <laughs> the disciples, hey, the guys are getting together. Everyone's going to be there. Peter's coming. John, James, and Nathaniel, all of them are going to be there. You need to come, Thomas. Come on. I can just see him shaking his head. She pleads with him, and he simply responds out of a hopelessness of heart. He says maybe something to the effect, no, Mary, Mary, I'm not going. Not going. Jesus won't be there. He's dead. Don't you know if I thought, if I had hope, I would see him, I would go? 
Don't you know that I loved him, Mary? And I still love him better than life. But Jesus is dead. Dead. He's dead, Mary. I was in that garden. I saw Judas kiss him. I saw them lead him away in chains. And I saw the soldiers scourge him. I saw him crowned with a crown of thorns. Mary, I was even there at Calvary when the blackest midnight descended in the middle of the day. I heard his bitter cry. Mary, I'll never forget it. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then I saw him bow his head, Mary. And then I saw that cruel, mean soldier go and take a spear and thrust it in the side. And Mary, I saw the blood come from him. Mary, I saw him die. Don't, don't talk to me about seeing Jesus again. Jesus is dead. The bitterness and sorrow of, of heart had driven him to despair. Now, can I tell you, we call him Doubting Thomas, but much more than a Doubting Thomas, he was a hopeless Thomas. His mind, he had no reason to go to that room. There's no sliver of hope he hung on to. May I just remind you the only difference between the believer that is an active disciple, not missing in action, but heavily active for Christ, and the believer that is missing in action, despairer of circumstances, is that the one still clings to hope, no matter how small that is. For Thomas, everything had collapsed. There was no star in the sky. There was no promise of the sun rising the next day. No horizon there for where there was a hope for a new dawn. So that, when he was the neediest of them all, he was not there when Jesus came and spoke. He was not present. Next Sunday morning, we'll continue the story. We'll see some things that Thomas missed out on because he was missing in action. And we'll also see, this is great, how he regained a hope that propelled him back into a faithful life and action. But can I ask you just a couple questions today? Are you missing an action? Do you participate in the assembling or do you forsake it? Are, are you encouraging and exhorting and embracing it while you're here at the assembly? You have hope today. Maybe this invitation, you, you, you just need to be honest and you need to cry out to God, God, I've lost hope. I'm not clinging to much. Father, I, I feel like I'm drowning in this world of fear, in this world of things going on in my life. I, I feel like I'm drowning. God, restore unto me my hope. Would you give me hope today? Maybe you're here this morning and the Holy Spirit has pricked your heart about not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Maybe you say, Father, I'm sorry. I, 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 I've been indifferent at times. I, I've sought for satisfaction somewhere else. Father, I'm sorry. I, I need to get back to being in the assembly and allowing you to work in that and meeting with Christ, allowing him to speak in those gatherings. Maybe you just simply need to confess being missing in action. Or maybe today you just need to say, God, I, I sure am scared. Father, I'm fearful what the future holds. Maybe it's this day, tomorrow, maybe it's this week, maybe it's in the next few years. God, I'm, I'm full of fear right now. Your word has said perfect love casteth out fear. So, Father, I pray you'd help me get rid of my fear and fill my heart with your love. Because, Father, you are love. I don't know what your need is today, but I do know this. God speaks through his word. He wants to do something for you today. Will you let him? Will you let him? Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the encouragement. It's